You're listening to Casting Class, an engineer's guide to manufacturing aluminum castings, hosted by Batesville Products. For over 75 years, Batesville Products has been engineering, casting, machining, inspecting, and polishing aluminum castings for over 70 industries nationwide. In today's episode, we'll continue to share our experience and industry secrets. Casting Class is in session. So today we're going to discuss fixing your casting defects. Tim, myself, and Jonathan will be um, guiding you through the presentation. We have Monty. He is a manufacturing engineer for Batesville Products and has over 40 years experience um, in a variety of foundries. And then you have Ernie, who is a metallurgical engineer um, with extensive experience in airspace and automotive industries. And then lastly, we have Brad, who has 35 years experience um, that has taken him over all over the world from Ohio to India to China. And in 2016, he created the Porosity Solutions Company. Rachel, appreciate it. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think in previous discussions, I had mentioned, uh, you know, with that wealth of knowledge across these three uh, gentlemen here, I'm going to look like an idiot today, I think. Um, <laughs> very small over here at the 10-year 10, 10 experience versus the 35 to 40 year there. So, um, you know, definitely a wealth of knowledge. So excited to have the, the guests that we do uh, today. Um, but today, mainly the, the six things that we want to go over um, and talk about with the, with the panel we have here uh, are really these six porosity defects. So first and foremost, you know, the surface porosity, uh, we have reaction porosity, gas holes, oxide related porosity, uh, any kind of shrinkage or hydrogen gas porosity. So with that, uh, let's, let's jump in here. Brad, you know, so, so what do you, what are we talking about here when we we're, we're talking about surface porosity? Well, you know, customers, first of all, customers call almost all defects porosity. So what we're looking at here is, is some blisters on, on this slide where it's flaked away, dirt in the, dirt in the sand mold. Um, maybe Ernie can expand on that a little bit. Uh, primarily just uh, lays on the surface in sand molds. It tends to be dirt if it's in the coke half of the mold. And then it tends to be, uh, or if it's in the drag half of the mold, then it tends to be a dross if it's in the cope half of the mold. Ernie brings up a good point when you're looking at uh, uh, when you're looking at porosity to, to look at the location and, and uh, that will help you determine what kind of porosity it is. One more thing on this slide, um, you, you, you know, uh, the oxides uh, show up in as surface porosity, but they're not really porosity until you machine the part. The, the oxides will be hard and, and they'll tend to tear. So when you're machining, uh, if you're having a lot of rejects on the surface and machining, those typically uh, are oxides. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pull out during the machining process. So, so the next one we'll talk about here would be the reaction porosity. And I think this was, uh, we actually had kind of a quick uh, conversation before we had gotten on. Um, and I think that's when, uh, when Brad hopped in and Brad called it what? Uh, reaction porosity, absolutely. There you go. There you know, uh, and, and the reason uh, Monty said, you, you know, if they, you, you have to dry it. So if you put a mold coating on and you cast that wet, there's going to be a reaction between the molten aluminum and the mold surface. It'll be just very close to the mold or to the core surface. Uh, and you won't see the porosity typically anywhere else in the part or adjacent to the part, just, just very close to the core. If you, if you have a round core, it'll often show up as just like a pattern of holes all kind of outlying the core, um, mm -hmm. but very much surface related. But but uh, on a sand core or on a core, if you have a reaction with the core, that, that's going to show up internal, you know, on the internal surfaces of the casting. So as Ernie said, it's, it's, it's surface related. If you were to take a cross section through, you're only going to see it, you know, uh, very close to the surface. It's not going to be internal. Typically, it's a, a finite type of porosity. It doesn't leak or anything. It's just what you see is what you have. Gas holes are, are almost always internal, almost always round in appearance. 
and usually they're very localized. They're usually based on on metal turbulence, uh, either either something coming down the the down sprue or something leaking in at some point in the gating system. Uh, they're almost always related to some form of metal turbulence, depending on how fast the uh, tilt pour is operating. Uh, it may hit bottom, cause turbulence in the bottom end before it goes into casting. How would somebody, uh, you know, anybody that's on today or, or anybody that has that type of question, is there a, uh, a science to, uh, you know, helping get that gas out? Is that slowing down the, the, the tilt pour? Is that um, on the molten metal side? A lot of this to do with the, the, the runners and the gating. Okay. Uh, slowing the slowing the velocity down or speeding it up, depending on what you want. Okay. It's trying to get like a lamellar flow. You, you don't want the metal tumbling out of that, out of the, the bottom of your gating system. You want it flowing out of the gating system. And it and that's maybe more of not a technical term. It's just if you picture what you're trying to do, you're trying to avoid that tumbling and, and the, the, uh, the chaos at the bottom of your sprue. You want it to come out of there in a smooth manner. And, and and it looks very very similar uh, to, to hydrogen porosity, which we'll talk about later. But the key is, as Ernie just said, it's localized. You know, it's going to be in the area where the turbulence is. If it's hydrogen, it's it's something in a melt, and it's going to be throughout the whole the, the, the whole uh, casting. So so if you you know you're not going to be able to fix an issue unless you can identify it. So what's you know that's why we're talking about the different types of porosity and the different t- characteristics. <laughs> Big question here with the the oxide inclusion. So there's a difference. You know, this is still caused by turbulence, but there's definitely a difference in um, the oxide inclusions versus what we just looked at. Um, it, explain that a little bit, Brad. All molten aluminum has an oxide layer. So if that layer gets folded in, it creates this oxide. And uh, uh, so so th- that's what you're seeing here. And oxide itself is really not porosity but it, it, it changes the solidification in that area so it doesn't completely fill out. And that's why you see uh, you see the porosity kind of intertwined uh, amongst the oxides there. It's not typically a, a, a well-defined porosity as much as you see the stringers. Uh, even even at, a, at a macro level, like if you're machining it, a lot of times you'll see a little bit of porosity that you've picked out as you've machined it, but you'll see a tail or a stringer tending to come out from behind it. If you're pulling, pouring in a sand casting and you're pouring too high or you get or your gating is not correct and, and, and you're filling too fast, you can get the oxide. So it can happen in anything. Uh, but the faster that you fill, uh, the more prone you're going to be to having them. You could see an oxide trap uh, behind a filter. That oxide was actually generated in the in the furnace or the melting furnace. So it's just not a result of your gating. It can be entrained in your melt. So if you're using a lot of scrap. And, and particularly uh, if you're remelting gating, because gating will have oxides on it, uh, you, you know, you, you, you can introduce those oxides right into the melt, as Ernie says, and, and they're going to stay in there unless you have some way to filter them out. If you're making an alloy addition, you have to make sure that you get it plunged and thoroughly distributed through the melt. And so the oxygen not only attaches to the aluminum to, to form the aluminum oxides, it, it will it will uh, combine with the magnesium to create create a magnesium oxide. Um, so the next one we want to talk about here would be shrinkage porosity. Um, and I think, you know, Brad mentioned it earlier on, a lot of the, the customers or prospects uh, consider everything porosity or a lot of different things porosity. Shrinkage isn't necessarily in that category, is it? Shrink uh, is a solidification defect. And, 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 you know, the only way to fix it is to make, is to freeze the metal uh, or, or to feed it. The metal there quicker uh, or, or you have to uh, chill it faster. Uh, I'll, I'll let Ernie go into detail because this is a, a very common problem, particularly on complicated or complex castings. First thing is it tends to be localized. Uh, second thing, it, it's, it's kind of misleading because it's, you can machine across the surface with shrinkage porosity and it'll, and it'll look wet, it'll look good, but it'll actually seep or leak because the interstices are all, are all connected. And so that, that's the form it takes. So you may have a part that looks very good. If you put it under pressure, you'll actually see it seeping a little bit. Uh, aluminum solidifies dendritically. 
you can get little areas trapped between those dendrites as they form. You just haven't been quite able to get metal to them. And again, it's, it's those interstices connected. It tends to be local. It's definitely related to, to feeding the part. And like I say, one of the characteristics is it, it just tends to have a very slow seep or leaky in it. One of the things that differentiates shrinkage porosity is it tends to appear elongated. Instead of having round porosity, it, it tends to be an elongated porosity, again, because it's trapped in between those interstices on the, like we saw on the dendritic. It, it, it's a progression uh, as, as, that, as you start to feed through the risers and stuff, depending on how well you did it, like you said, it, the, the shrinkage, the elongated shrinkage is, is your first near miss. <laughs> Then it goes to the sponge shrinkage, which means you've missed it, you missed your feeding range by just a little bit more. And then the one where you just don't quite have it yet goes to a shrinkage cavity. Okay. And, uh, and so it's a progression of, of shrinkage defects, basically, with the elongated, the, the, the least severe, then into the sponge shrinkage, and then into the uh, shrinkage cavity. And these slides here happen to be shrinkage cavity. And so you've actually failed to get metal into a, to, to that portion of the part, and it's actually isolated a cavity. Common, commonly happens, uh, well, a couple of places. One is the last place to solidify. It'll happen a lot uh, towards the gate. Also, it happens between thick and thin surfaces, thick and thin walls of the casting. If your risers are working the way they should be, um, you shouldn't get too much shrink. <laughs> So uh, the next one uh, would be the hydrogen gas porosity. Uh, this is more of a reaction with the molten aluminum to the air. So hydrogen in the air, it has an affinity for the aluminum. It's going to re it'd rather be in aluminum than in the air. All, all molten aluminum is going to have hydrogen. And, and so the, the issue is how much, how much can you stand when you cast? Do you want, do you want uh, uh, hydrogen or porosity-free castings? And if so, you need to degas. And the only way to get rid of the hydrogen in the, in the molten aluminum is to gas, degas. So this is just the degassing and, uh, and degassing media, typically argon and nitrogen. The argon and nitrogen attach to the uh, hydrogen and float it to the top. When the hydrogen reaches the surface, it actually burns off. So if you have a lot of hydrogen, you actually see uh, flames on the surface. The chlorine and the SF6 actually uh, chemically uh, combine with the hydrogen, but bring it to the top in the same manner. There's two two main factors, and one is the, the, the moisture in the air. So the, the, the uh, higher the humidity, the, the faster the hydrogen is going to go in. And, and number two is the metal temperature. So, so at, 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 four, at 1,400 degrees, over 1,400 degrees, I think it's every 100 or 150 degrees after that, the, the rate that the hydrogen enters doubles. Typically, that's why you want to cast, you know, your molten metal uh, temperature, your casting temperature to be you know, 1375, uh, 1400 at the very top, if all possible. Before you go on, the key thing, the hydrogen is soluble in molten aluminum, but it's not in solid aluminum. So as the aluminum solidifies, that gas comes out and forms porosity in your casting. As I said, the, the hydrogen is throughout the melt. So it's going to be everywhere in the casting. It, it's not going to be lo localized. So it's very easy to tell if you have a hydrogen porosity issue. It's not going to be on a surface. Your surface is going to look fine. But if you machine the part, you're going to see the holes. If you cut the part in, uh, if you cut the part, section it as it's shown here, you're going to see the holes throughout. Got a couple more questions, Tim, before we move on. Um, yeah. First, what is your thoughts about adding gas to the metal to combat shrinkage? Yes. Yeah, I call that organic modification. <laughs> <laughs> there's always gas in a casting it's not necessarily to your advantage to have it gas free all the time it's a match up to what your customer requirements is to what the what the casting is and, and it's an economic matchup it depends on again where you want to go with your part uh, adding gas in what it does is it, it takes up some of that shrinkage porosity we talked about Mm -hmm. it, it takes up some of that volume expansion of that and, and it gives your and it will make your part it spreads that out so you tend not to congregate your, your shrinkage and stuff and that's basically what it does very common practice about why it's so important to identify the gas level you have and then know the gas level you want uh because it's it's it may be two different things it's just not always get it all out if the uh, criteria is a good surface finish uh then the internal that doesn't matter right 
Uh, so, so, so the hydrogen porosity is, ne is never on the surface. Uh, so, so, you know, and shrink, shrink can be, and shrink typically is. So, so if you want to, you know, eliminate your shrink or uh, you have a corner that needs to be good where you don't need shrink in the corner of the casting, uh, sometimes gas, gas is, a gas level is okay. Pretty much a standard practice in permanent mold. Uh, depending on certain parts to add to add some gas in some form or another. I've seen potatoes, I've seen two by fours, I've seen pretty much everything used to add a little gas into the part. Typically on a 356, if you have a 2.59 specific gravity where you measure your, your reduced pressure test sample, a, a sample solidified under vacuum, uh, if it's, if it's 2.59 or higher, you're not going to have hydrogen frosty in your casting. It's lower than that you can, and the lower, the, the farther lower it gets, uh, the more hydrogen that will be in there. But if you wanted uh, uh, hydrogen gas in, in, in the casting, so to reduce that shrink, as we talked about earlier, uh, you might say, okay, I need to run in a range of 2.46 to 2.50. And, and that's where using specific gravity is, is the best way to evaluate the amount of uh, hydrogen that's in your molten aluminum. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, hopping on today. And again, uh, special thanks to our, our guests joining. Um, hi, again, highly encourage uh, hopping on the website, reaching out to these guys. Uh, any additional questions, um, you know, we'd be happy to answer offline. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Casting Class, an engineer's guide to manufacturing aluminum castings hosted by Batesville Products. Be on the lookout for our next casting class on the first Wednesday of every month. Until then, you can find more resources like videos, written guides, and case studies on our website, BatesvilleProducts.com. That's BatesvilleProducts.com. See you next month.